as you ponder what makes us forget, know that from a research perspective and a neuroscientific angle, there are quite a few variables that influence the rate and the amount at which we forget. You can see some of these variables listed here on the screen. There are so many elements that can contribute to our forgetfulness. Anything from motivation to emotion to the lack of interaction that you mentioned here in the chat box to the delivery style, even the type of medication that your audiences may be taking or the amount of sleep they got the night before can influence the amount that they forget. Luckily though, while we're not so concerned about how much people forget, we know that overall we forget exponentially at the same rate. There is a concept called the forgetting curve. If you get the, a minute um, after this presentation, check it out. You can learn a little bit more about it. There is, in fact, even a, a scientific formula that explains how initially, after we have been exposed to some new content, we forget most of it very quickly, after which that forgetting curve levels off. And this is why quite often memories that have settled for you years back are still settled in and they're less prone to forgetting than new things that you constantly bring into uh, to your attention and to memory. Despite this, and according to this curve, it's possible that we forget up to 90%, sometimes even more of content that we are exposed to. The worst problem compared to quantity of forgetting is the randomness of it. So it's not only that our audiences retain few bits from our content is the fact that they tend to retain random bits from our content and that is way worse because imagine let's just say you had a presentation and these three things were the most important for your audience to retain and yet when you ask them days later what is it that you took out of that presentation they mentioned three other random things that just hurts not only does it hurt the ego because you have put so much into a presentation but when you talk about random memory we look at all sorts of negative consequences ranging from all these aspects that you see here listed on my screen and as a result of that we're encountering a lot of unproductive, a lot of financially unrewarding moments where presentations are concerned. So this is why I would like to propose that we're not so concerned about how much our audiences are forgetting from our content but rather can we move them from remembering some things to remembering the right things. And the answer to that is based on neuroscientific principles. We love the fact that these days, because we have advanced so much in terms of technology that studies the brain, we can use some of these scientific and brain science based principles to guide our presentations in a way that is reliable and is consistent. Those two characteristics that science can give us. Quite often, when I approach presentations, I approach them from the aspect aspect of memory because it's so rewarding to a presenter to have something in mind and days later to ask an audience what do you remember and for them to say what you wanted them to say and quite often people forget many of the aspects that you listed in the chat box confirm this as well because they didn't pay attention to us in the first place attention paves the way to memory and then we also ask the question why is it important for people to remember anything from your presentation it's important because people decide based on what they remember hardly ever do you have participants in any of your presentations and by the way I use the word presentation loosely it could be training purposes it could be informative it could be sales elements regardless what your job title is you're creating some presentations right now where it would be very satisfying to you if people made some de decisions around them. We decide based on what we remember. And this is why this continuum, even though it doesn't appear so linearly in our minds, is it, it is worth studying, however, because this right here, this combination, is the combination of the skill of the future. If right now you, as a communicator, can attract your audience's attention, get them to remember what you want them to remember, and make it easy for them to decide in your favor, this right here will make you stay relevant for many decades to come. It is this combination that shows us that leads to some behavioral change, and it is this combination that we have called the Rexy method. Rexy comes from the Latin verb to direct or to guide. And for the rest of the presentation, I'd love to share with you some practical guidelines, initially about attention and just a little bit about memory. We start here with attention just because we're very humbled by the fact that attention is definitely mandatory to people remembering the right things, 
not just random things. So our um, official agenda for the day is to look at some practical guidelines and easy to implement guidelines related to attention so that we can ease our way into uh, what makes things memorable. And let's start with the first one, which is this concept of habituation. Habituation means that as you get used to a stimulus, you start paying less and less attention to it. Let's just say that this morning when you came to your office, maybe there was some radio music in the background. You paid attention to it probably at first, but then as you got used to it, it became just that, background. In fact, I'm curious to know what is something that you've habituated to in your office. You can use um, the same Q&A pad and um, stay in touch with me. I'm curious to know what is something that you've habituated to in your surroundings. Kim says the TV in the background and uh, Leopoldo says where I work at home, people talking in the background, children's noise. You have some heater blower, Carol says, and Connie mentions the constant coworker chatter, sound of ringing phones and copy machines and radio, colleagues texting and probably they haven't turned their silent function on, water in the pipes near the office. I'm sure that many of you are probably listening to some traffic right now. And I'm so glad that you can habituate to all of the stimulation that you're listing because from an evolutionary perspective, habit habituation definitely has a strong value. You would go nuts if you weren't able to habituate to all these things that you're listing here, printers and music and people talking and even the sound of your own breathing. Imagine if we couldn't habituate to that. Unfortunately, however, the human brain habituates very fast and it is indeed habituation that quite often kills presentations. In fact, if we were to offer an unscientific formula for some presentations, if things lead to habituation, it would probably go something like this. Habituation is uh, an intriguing concept for us to study as a neuroscientist because we habituate very, very fast. Take communication, for instance. In the beginning, we were just so excited to communicate face to face. And then historically, we found other means of communication and we habituated to those, and we habituated to those, and to this, up to the point where these days, if you don't have internet connection when you're flying, the world is just about over. As you're looking at my list here and you're pondering this concept of habituation, what is something that you used to consider you used to consider quite a reward, quite exciting, but right now you're thinking it's a treat or it's just something mundane? I have an official polling question for this. We have some uh, answers here on the screen. So some of you have habituated to Nutella and movies and chocolate and uh, streaming. Imagine there was a, a time that these elements used to be considered quite a treat but now for some of us they are mundane. The intriguing part about um, habituation and how quickly we are used to a, a reward is this. Anytime the brain is given a reward, it is ready for the next reward. And for the next time, we're expecting that reward. And sometimes even if that reward is doubled, then you expect the higher dose and that becomes the norm. This is why it is very critical to, uh, to look at this concept of habituation and if we know that we want to go around it, from a scientific point, standpoint, we have to ask what is it really that influences habituation? And we know from research that habituation is influenced by these two factors that you see here listed on my screen. One is related to stimulus internal variation. You know how as psychologists we always have fancy ways of uh, phrasing everything. But stimulus internal variation simply means that things change over time in terms of stimulation. This is why it's very hard for us to habituate to the sound and images that are coming from a TV set, especially if it's an enticing movie, whereas it's very easy to habituate to the sound of a running fan. For this first example, it is um, very hard just because things change constantly and internally. They vary internally and that's what makes habituation harder. Whereas for a, for a running fan, there's only one noise, one constant noise and things don't change so much. There is a second factor that influences habituation that is a little bit more subjective. I'm sure that you have met people who take a lot to get excited almost at anything. 
and if they perceive novelty, they don't really show it all that much. Or there are the opposite of, of uh, your audience, where people get excited at the smallest stimulus. While these things are subjective, they can be studied scientifically. For instance, if you look at blood pressure or heart rate, and if you hook up all sorts of monitors to their heads, you can still notice how much excitement and how much perceived novelty and familiarity people have and whether they show some arousal in front of specific stimulation. However, while this second element is harder for you to control as a communicator, this is something that you definitely have control over. How much you have power over varying the stimulus, that is definitely something that you can ask yourself and work on. And those are the elements that we'll focus on here when it comes to habituation. And quite often we're learning from different fields that do value the importance of stimulus variation. And that has got to be Hollywood. And notice how much we have progressed in terms of the amount of stimulation that we're providing our viewers. If you look at the average shot length for movies in the 30s and 40s, notice that they were residing at about this much. As we look at the average shot length for current movies, take a quick, uh, a quick guess. Use the Q&A pad again and tell me what do you think the average shot length for movies is these days? I can see an average from the responses that you're offering. Some of you are saying four seconds, seven seconds, two seconds. I like how aggressive uh, you're getting. But if we were to take an average from all the responses that you have, you're probably around this remark right here, which is four seconds. The movie Born Supremacy, I'm sure that many of you know of it. The average shot length was 2.4 seconds in the Born Supremacy. This is huge. There are scenes in there where the emotion is so chaotic that you can hardly detect what is going on. And overall, these are trends that we're noticing. Not only have shot lengths have grown shorter, but there is motion and movement that have increased significantly in the same movie and then to make matters worse we're merging the two we're taking a shorter shot length and we're adding more emotion onto it and now we have that combination of very short things that are happening happening at a very fast speed and at some point I'm wondering if we'll reach you know, those scenes where you can't really detect what's going on, however you'll have a feeling of rapid movement and the feeling of something that is going on at um, supersonic uh, speeds. Uh, this is a, definitely a, a James Bond film, but I was just mentioning uh, there's somebody who's asking in the, in the Q&A, the, um, the James Bonds reside around four seconds, you can take that at uh, even higher speed. So for the born supremacy, the uh, average shot length was 2.4. 2 it's amazing to me because it's obviously not the entire movie is presented at that rate. However, you have very good balanced scenes between something that moves very fast and something that moves a little bit slower. The point that I'm making and that needs to be sobering all of us is the fact that for the modern brain, the level of stimulation has increased. This is huge. Our threshold for stimulation has increased and as audiences are coming to your presentation, their brains are accustomed to this kind of stimulation and instead sometimes they may get this type of I don't want to call it stimulation, I may call it lack of stimulation. So we have to be cautious because if this is what they're used to and this is what they're getting, it's no wonder that we're almost creating invitations for people to multitask because we're not meeting up the uh, expectations for how much stimulation to provide. So to borrow a Hollywood uh, phrase, as you're investigating your own communication materials right now in your own presentations, how often do you provide a cut? Because if we don't, and if we don't have enough stimulus variation in presentations, you're almost making it too easy for people to look away. I have heard different statistics. Some of them recommend that every three minutes we provide a cut, so to speak, in the sense of changing something in your presentation style, whether it's moving from slides to a demo, whether it's moving from simple lecture to some conversations, whether it's move, moving from something that is fairly static to something that is very dynamic, you would have to reflect on the own, your own changes that you can make happen. 
the idea is not so much in what you're changing, but in how often you're changing and in how often we're providing that cut. And uh, to investigate this a, a bit further, we have to understand what is it really that takes place in the brain when we habituate. And the answer to that has to do with this neurotransmitter called dopamine. I'm sure that this is a phrase that you're fairly used to because it has been documented and alluded to in a lot of scientific journals lately. In fact, a lot of people are calling dopamine the Kim Kardashian of neurotransmitters, which I don't think is um, fair to dopamine. But dopamine is a neurotransmitter that has to do with pleasure and reward. And how do we study it? We take a rat and we identify the area in the rat's brain where that chemical is being released. And we put an electrode into it. And we teach the rat to press a lever so that each time he presses, then that dopamine gets released in his brain. And because he enjoys it oh so much, he's willing to do that effort over and over and over because it feels great. And unfortunately, sometimes they do it so much until they die. It feels that darn good. The conclusion, however, that we're drawing from this is that dopamine definitely leads to a greater effort that we're willing to exert. And um, there are a few other functions that you'll be intrigued in, um, in knowing as we keep studying this, uh, this neurotransmitter. We're also looking at monkeys, for instance. Let's just say that you're organizing an experiment where the monkey gets a reward as a result of exerting some effort, and that's great. And when the monkey knows that it will get this reward, the dopamine level goes up. We already know that and we've identified that. However, what scientists are finding out is that quite often when you're only providing a signal for the experiment, so the experiment hasn't even started. Let's just say that the monkey comes into a room and now there's a light that goes on and the monkey knows that as a result of some effort it will get the reward. Just with that signal alone that creates anticipation, the dopamine level goes up even more. And the conclusion from that is that quite often it's not so much about the act itself that we're willing to do, it's about the anticipation of that act that can create that, uh, that chemical. So it's not so much always about the pleasure and getting this reward, it is about the anticipation of pleasure. And what scientists are finding out even more is they're asking the question, what if they were to provide this reward not every single time, but maybe 25% of the time that the experiment takes place, or maybe 75% of the time that the experiment takes place. So in other words, there is some uncertainty going on, and the monkey doesn't know if it will do the effort, will it get the reward every single time. And this is what the findings were. When the monkey got the reward only 50% of the time, notice how much more the dopamine level shot way up. So see, including just that tiny element of uncertainty where you don't know what the outcome is going to be every single time, and I'm impri impressed and surprised that it wasn't 25%, it wasn't 75% of the time, it was half the time, where literally you can't predict patterns and you cannot know what happens next. That's when you're willing to keep on doing the effort. And I come back to that link of dopamine and effort because this is why it's worthwhile for us to pay attention to it and to enable it into our own audience's brain because when that chemical is present, your audiences may be more likely to exert some effort in your favor, even if in the beginning that effort is nothing else but at least them paying attention to you. So as you're looking at these three elements on my screen, they're more likely for your audiences to pay attention and exert some effort if these three are present. When they're not, by the way, just like as you see here in this, uh, in this picture, you are decreasing the likelihood that people will exert any kind of effort in your favor. So as you're looking at these, uh, these three elements, keep on pondering how often and how much are they present in your current communication materials, whether you're creating training, whether you're creating sales presentations, whether you're creating IT materials or financial charts, at some point any of these three elements will help you out to create that, uh, that dopamine. Here's the, uh, the polling question again, you'll have the link for this in your, in your chat box. I'm curious to know as you reflect on your communication materials, how much of it do you feel that you're providing your audiences right now in terms of uncertainty, including some anticipation, providing your audiences with rewards, 
and I love to see these uh, these numbers uh, changing and at some point leveling off. And notice how rewards are fairly prevalent, especially if you're coming from the academic uh, side of things. I think over there we know how to provide rewards to our audiences fairly well. Sometimes in the corporate world we're a little bit more cautious because everything has to be politically correct and, and fair in terms of rewards and um, we struggle a bit more. Sometimes it's easier to reward kids than it is to reward adults. But I see that the reward you have that covered. I'm impressed to see about the, um, the balance between uncertainty and um, anticipation. Sometimes uncertainty is something that people struggle with because it's a little bit of a counterintuitive concept. They figure that everything should be made obvious and certain for an audience. They have joined our sessions in order to learn something that we have control over. And um, the, uh, the finding is that if you create just a tiny touch of anticipation, the chemical that you're releasing is strong enough for sustaining a little bit of extra effort from your from your audiences. And um, especially when it comes to uncertainty, know that whatever your audience perceives as true or false or something that can be managed fairly easily and it's fairly simple can only hold attention for so long. This is huge because I keep this uh, I keep seeing this trend towards zen-like presentations where things are very simple and you only provide your audiences with very uh, very little stimulation in terms of what's going on on the screen but just know that in terms of keeping people in there it's things that you cannot anticipate fully and things that invite a, a, a certain amount of uncertainty that will keep them in there longer. It's a huge differentiation to make between something that is perceived as simple, therefore manageable, and something that is perceived as more complex and therefore a little bit more uncertain that will keep their attention for a longer period of time. And when it comes to uncertainty, we don't look at that in a random kind of way, we look at that scientifically. And I say welcomed uncertainty because not all uncertainty is um, feeling very pleasant to, uh, to all of us. For instance, if you have a picnic planned and you don't know if it's going to rain or if you're waiting for a doctor's diagnosis, definitely not the kind of uncertainty that we prefer. But for other elements, we know that scientifically speaking, there's a formula according to which if you have these three elements that you see here on my screen, you're more likely to release that, uh, that chemical. Imagine this formula as you're looking at its components here applied to a political election for instance, if you have some candidates, let's just say four of them, not just two, and all four are fairly equal and they have equal chances of being uh, selected and anything can happen in any kind of sequence and you don't know who's going to be on next, now you have attention and now things are getting excited, exciting. Or apply this formula to a tennis tournament for instance, especially in the beginning stages if you have players that are fairly equal in skills and as we get closer and closer to the finals there are still four of them left and um, things are getting excited because anything can happen in any kind of sequence with equal probability. That is fun to watch and you're willing to stay up till way late at night and see what's going on. So as you're reflecting on these three elements and notice that under uncertainty there's particular ways in which you can enable that, giving people some options and creating some sense of suspense, not always making things so obvious and enable people to discover things on, um, on their own. All of those will contribute to ensuring that your audiences are willing to exert an extra amount of effort, even if it's nothing else, but at least to stay with you a little bit longer. Here are some um, conclusions from this very first section on, um, on habituation. By the way, you can email me. I can uh, send you a visual uh, handout based on these uh, elements that you're observing right now. And uh, before I go uh, any further, I want to uh, I want to see if there are any kind of uh, questions, a shock that you uh, have seen so far or you have singled out for me here. And um, I'm looking at um, our chat box here and you're mentioning um, things around uh, examples for the, uh, for the three, reward, anticipation and uncertainty. For rewards, I have seen uh, various uh, various kinds. Sometimes um, recognition can be a, a reward. Let's just say that um, in a presentation you're having um, 
some uh, guest speakers who have done something amazing and you're valuing their work in front of others. Of course, you can have monetary rewards. Sometimes uh, we do that in, um, in our presentations. For instance, even in today's presentation, I will have a brief contest that will be taking place in just a few minutes. And we have some fun Starbucks cards for the most creative stories we will receive just in a little short while and uh, you will see what's going on there. So we'll study a little bit more around rewards and see what your audience is motivated by and what would um, make it fun for, for them to receive in the uh, sense of, uh, in the case of monkeys, obviously they were motivated by a reward that was um, food related and um, I'm sure they were willing to exert that effort for that kind of reward which is satisfying compared to if somebody had given them uh, some fancy pens constantly look back and, and wonder what is my audience likely to be motivated by and build your rewards around that. For anticipation, you know what's a good population to learn from in terms of um, building it is uh, newscasters. You see them coming on around 5 o'clock and you hear them say, what will happen to the stock market in the next two weeks? And should you go away for the holidays? All of this and more at 11. And you stay up till 11 and if those answers are very important to you. You're willing to exert the extra effort and sometimes you're satisfied that you did. Sometimes you're disappointed that you did. So be very cautious about anticipation because while we know scientifically speaking that it enables your audiences to stay with you longer, it's also a chance to disappoint. So make sure that if you are indeed building anticipation, you live up to it. And um, for uncertainty, you're noticing these three subsets here that any time you're giving your audiences some choices, let's just say that even for today's presentation, as I presented to you those three circles, remember we're talking about attention, memory, and decision making. What if I had said for the rest of the presentation, I can speak only about one of the three, you choose it. See now, because we don't know where this is going, you have a little bit of extra attention and extra motivation to stay on and see what's, uh, what's happening. Some suspense, I was um, announcing our contest even for this session and that is one way to, uh, to create it. And for discovery, inviting people to, dis to discover things on, um, on their own versus you giving them everything, those would be examples of how you can embed all three. You don't have to have all three in all presentations, but at least one that would give you the rewards, you're coming back to the rewards, of that extra effort that we need from, um, from our audiences. If you're thinking about how does this uh, differ in terms of adults versus, uh, versus teens, obviously the motivational drivers may be different based on age and sometimes even gender, sometimes even culture. So instead of asking how does it differ from adults to teens, ask the other question which is regardless of who my audience is, do I know what they're likely to be motivated by? And once you find those answers, then it will be a lot easier to create some of these elements. Because as you can imagine, what constitutes anticipation for an adolescent will be definitely different on what constitutes uh, anticipation for, for an adult. We continue on with the uh, idea of attention paving the way to memory and when it comes to attention scientifically speaking we know that attention depends on what your audiences sense already know and can infer and I'll describe each of these three starting with the t with the senses often people don't pay attention to us because they have not paid attention to uh, they don't remember things because they have not paid attention to us in the first place and if you appeal to their senses you increase at least the likelihood that they are focused on something how do we attract the senses you see some components here on the screen any of these will work in any of your materials and the reason you want to focus definitely at some point on any of these senses, especially in business presentations or academic presentations, brightness and color and size and motion, they're very easy to, uh, to implement. But the reason you want to focus on them is because unless you attract attention with some of these first, it, you're making it harder for information to go into a higher level of processing where now you're adding meaning onto those and it's, a, it's an element that I'll speak about a little bit more in detail towards the end of our presentation. We're intrigued by the senses because for instance there was an MRI study that was done not too long ago where these researchers were observing people's brains in an MRI machine as they were watching some indoor and outdoor screenshots very much like you see here on my screen. And as people were processing these pictures, 
they were noticing that those that people were indeed paying attention to and focused on were already being encoded. So before people were given a memory test to ask which one of these pictures do you remember more, the scientists were already to be able to predict which memories were fated to being encoded and which images were fated to be forgotten. And in some ways, and I get chills any time that I say this, we're starting to watch the birth of a memory from a technology perspective. That is huge. And what we're learning from these studies is that if we can force people to take a look at something that you consider important, then already you're increasing the likelihood that they will remember that element. So this is why we say, constantly play with color. Right now, as you're looking at my screen, I know exactly where your eyes are going because of the use of color. As you're looking at my screen right now, here's a, another screenshot from someone's presentation. I know where you're looking just because of, of the use of size. It's Im impossible to escape this, uh, this screen just because it's so huge and it's in your face and it's aggressive. But at least I know that through the uses of these physical elements, physical properties, I draw your attention to a stimulus that let's just say at some point I consider it important for your, for your memory. And because I'm such a great believer in, um, in these physical properties and attracting people's attention, attention paves the way to memory, here's the uh, part of, uh, of the contest from our presentation. I'm, uh, I'm wondering what attracts others' attention to you, and um, I'll help you answer this question easily. I know many of you are attending this session wearing some sort of shoes. I'd love to know what stories your shoes could tell. And I'm giving you an example here of some stories because I would love for you to take a picture of your shoes and attach to it one or two sentences that can explain your shoe story. I promise that um, we will look through carefully through all of them and deem the most creative stories. And one of the uh, consequences of that exercise is that, as you can see, when you force us to focus on those physical properties, there are the shoes and these are the colors and this is the composition, I guarantee that for those of you who are still participating in the session, it makes it very hard to look away because attention is based on the senses and we draw attention that way. Here is another dimension of attention. Attention is also based on what your audiences already know. I'm sure that many of you, especially if you're coming from the academia, this is a, a fairly intuitive concept. What is not fairly intuitive is what people do with new content. And our advice from a scientific perspective is to constantly link content to what people already know. I'm very humbled by this book that you see here on my screen this author describes fairly esoteric and fairly abstract concepts such as the ones that are listed here. It's not always the easiest task to find good definitions for anxiety or compassion or courage, but yet this is how she does it. Read my screen and notice how she describes anxiety. I just so enjoy how she says, he kissed me once on the forehead and I have had a headache for two years. Do you see how she describes something that is fairly abstract through concrete words that you already know and can master? Here's her definition of compassion. You can already see, she doesn't even have to show us PowerPoint slides because you can see the bright sweaters and you can see playing volleyball. Notice how she describes despair. This is her definition of anger. This is her definition of longing. Constantly wonder as you reflect on your own materials and your own new content, how are you linking it to something that they already know? And I guarantee that people then pay attention more because the brain literally and physically notices more of what it already knows and that's huge. And here's the third component here for attention. We also know that attention depends on inferences that we constantly tend to make about the world around us. For instance, we see a dark sky like this and we infer rain. We see a tall person or we quite often infer that he may be good at basketball. We see somebody who is um, maybe more technology inclined or thinking surely he must be good with computers. We make inferences all the time. For instance, let's just say that you're driving down the road and suddenly you will get to see this sign that is obscured by an overgrown tree branch and you're not thinking, gee, this is a weird sequence of consonants. 
based on inferences that you have learned how to make, you know that this is a stop sign and you'll be well served if you hit the brakes. We constantly make inferences around on the world around us. And as you're looking here at my screen, use the Q&A box and tell me what inferences are you making about him. A few of you are mentioning that he's had a bad day, he may be depressed or maybe in some sort of despair, maybe he's tired. No one has uh, mentioned um, hangovers just yet, but I'm sure maybe some of you are thinking it. Some of you are considering he might be homeless or maybe he's in uh, deep thought, maybe he's stretching. Somebody said, I love how Gilbert says here, he may have lost his girlfriend and he's really sad. So notice how if we were to investigate every single one of your individual responses, the inferences are quite often different and your audiences are not going to be that much different from you as you're making inferences. Notice that based on your previous expectations and experiences and points of view that you have developed through your entire life, as you're looking even at him, some of you may be thinking, oh man, and he's wasting time. Maybe some of you are thinking, well, he's actually lost in reflective thought and that helps. And as you're looking at some of these people, you're thinking maybe some of them are contributing to the conversation or maybe some of them are actually detrimental to the conversation. All of your experiences and things that you have accumulated through your lifetime are enabling you to form a point of view and based on those you develop some assumptions and based on those you draw some conclusions. And just know that if we took a few extra seconds as you investigate your content in your audience that quite often this sequence can lead you to the wrong conclusions. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm curious to know and please use the Q&A box for, uh, for this one. I would love to know what you have been wrong about lately because so often we trust in our point of view and in the assumptions that we have about the world that we hardly ever stop to question them and it's a shame because if we do stop to question we develop broader points of view therefore we can appeal to audiences differently therefore we can attract attention differently. What have you been wrong about lately? Carolyn says, a text message my boyfriend sent me. He wanted me to know I w how I was and I thought he was being mean. So she thought he was saying, so what's the, uh, what's the deal? Shannon says, I was wrong about the maturity of 22-year-olds. You're saying someone who spoke really fast was nervous about a meeting, but maybe she was just talking fast. Anthony says, I was wrong about somebody's intention. See, we constantly make assumptions. Aaron says, I was wrong about how an email would be received. I like what Aslam says in a very genuine and, and profound way. He says, I was wrong about underestimating our youth. That is huge because quite often if you dare to say to take just a little bit of extra time and think, is my point of view broad enough? Is my point of view relying on the right things? Is my point of view coming from a good place or is it coming from a dark place? constantly question those assumptions and as you do question their assumptions as well and the reason this is critical is because when you broaden your point of view their brains are going to notice things differently that is, that is why you want to wonder what is it that I'm thinking what's my point of view but also start with their point of view often it is so easy to start any kind of presentation or training session from where you're sitting versus from where you're sitting constantly broaden your point of view. And here is a big brief summary for the second piece which deals with attention being dependent on what your audiences sense, what they already know, and what conclusions they might take. And by the way, if you want to learn more about the brain science behind the presentations, we're hosting a virtual workshop. You have the dates listed here on the screen and you can email me about information for how to register for, for the workshop. You have my email address already. And as we are getting close to the end of our time together, I'll mention one extra guideline around building attention so that people remember what you want them to remember. And quite often from a scientific standpoint, we're noticing that memory depends on the type of processing that you're enabling your audiences to do. And this is what I mean by this. In any type of materials that you build for your audiences, whether they include images and sounds and various exercises, we're realizing that the deeper they process that material, the more likely that a memory is formed. And this is what I mean by various levels of processing. We already talked about physical properties of elements that you provide your audiences, whether those are pictures or some slides that you create, 
those are physical properties that you intend for them to get attention. So let's just say that I wanted you to remember the word table. I could say, is this written in capital letters? And notice how I would only be prompting you to pay attention to the physical property of the word. That's, that's all. I can also prompt you to pay attention to how a word sounds. Let's just say that I wanted you to remember the word cat. And I would ask you, does this rhyme with mat? So I would prompt you to only pay attention to the phonetical properties of this word. I'm mentioning this because while these two are fairly important, they're not sufficient for memories to be formed and especially for something to be long lasting, which was what our promise for the session was. If I want longer lasting memories, notice what happens when I go a little bit deeper and now I make you focus on what a word means. So let's just say that I wanted you to remember the word Pomeranian. The minute that I ask is the word a type of dog, I'm prompting you to focus on the semantic of it versus the physical properties of a word. So constantly wonder what your materials mean to your audience. So let's just say that you had a sequence of communication components. They don't always have to happen in PowerPoint. This could be easily a conversation. But if you every so often go beyond the physical aspect of what you provide and insist on the meaning of what that offers, now you're creating the uh, circumstances for longer lasting memory because you have enabled people to process your materials deeper. Constantly ask, what does this mean to you? What does this mean to you? What does this mean to you? And obviously, as we get closer to, uh, to the end of the session, I would love to know what some of these principles that you have been exposed to would mean to you and to the communication materials that you are creating. As you're looking at this list, and um, you have my email address um, over there that you can uh, use for, for the handout, take a, a few seconds and, uh, and reflect on this. Are there some that you will find fairly easy to, uh, to implement? Are there some that uh, you think, oh, this is a little bit uh, harder, but I can, um, I can see the merit of it? continue to, uh, to ask those questions, obviously you'll get the, uh, the longer list as well. And as I mentioned, you can also join us for, uh, for more in an upcoming workshop. But even as you have been exposed to some of these, uh, these elements, um, here's a, a polling question, one of the, the formal ones for you. As you're reflecting on what you have learned today, what will you do differently the next time you present? So you can click on that um, polling um, question and um, share with us some of your answers. I'm enjoying seeing this uh, coming in. I love that you're saying um, I'm considering more uh, more cuts and uh, more visual aids and even some interruptions. Interruptions don't always have to be bad. They avoid that habituation. Notice how uh, you're thinking about maybe three minute changes and I'm enjoying uh, the fact that you are willing to ask more questions and uh, think of elements from their point of view and uh, things are very visual and dynamic here, as you can see on, the, on my screen, very difficult to look away. Constantly wonder, how can I apply those, uh, those elements that, uh, that you learn? And I guarantee that as you're, um, as you're looking at uh, any of these elements, I'm going to, uh, to slow things down for a bit. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's the summary. I guarantee that you, if you implement even one or two for your next presentation, which I challenge you to do, you will increase the likelihood that they pay attention. Therefore, you increase the likelihood that uh, they will remember. We started with the premise that people remember few things and random bits from your, from your information. As you're using some of these principles, you'll, ena you'll enable them to take control over what it is that you want them to remember. It is huge and definitely the skill for the modern presenter to control and influence what others take away. I will uh, leave a few extra minutes here for, uh, for some questions. I'm monitoring the, uh, the Q&A uh, pad here. Somebody's asking which application do I use to create uh, the slides that you have seen. The uh, application that you saw here through the entire presentation was PowerPoint. The graphics were created in um, Photoshop and in design and imported into PowerPoint. PowerPoint, even though it has been 
a tool that has carried some stigma through the years. It is still a fairly solid application if you know some of the ins and outs, in terms, in, especially in terms of animation. And once you do, and if you have a message that you believe in and you have great chemistry with, then you can definitely rescue PowerPoint from uh, the uh, the dark space that sometimes the dark corners that it sometimes goes into. Quite often, I advocate that um, to blame PowerPoint. Um, for a bad presentation is like blaming the pen for bad poetry. It's a, it's a tool that can definitely be put to, uh, to good use. Ashok, are you um, noticing any other questions? Uh, somebody, uh, he, Peter here is um, asking a, a very intriguing question to me which scientists have not found uh, a clear answer to yet. Peter says, can you talk in any detail about the power of three in presentations and training? And this is a, a question that is definitely on my research list because we are failing to find out why in the world it's an intuitive instrument, isn't it, to think offer people three elements. We don't have much backing for it, but I will tell you a few research findings that uh, can allude to it. This is, uh, this is what we know. Going beyond the number four in anything, in terms, especially in terms of memory, creates cognitive tension. And what you as a communicator would like to have is the opposite of that, which is cognitive ease. Cognitive ease is the psychological construct that we study in, um, in various research um, components quite quite often. Cognitive ease is something that you want to provide your audiences with and you're noticing that number four is starting to be the, the magic after which things start breaking. So for instance, there are studies that were done where people are asked, name ten reasons why you love your BMW. And people sat down, they were BMW owners and they wrote the four the ten reasons. And afterwards the subsequent question surprised them. They were asked how much do you like your BMW? And this is what they found out. People who listed more reasons tended to like their cars less. And the concept was related to this um, idea of cognitive ease that after number four the brain had to try harder to come up with things. So if you're making it easy for your audience to bring to mind that which you consider important, that means you're, you're easing that, that cognitive process. And obviously number three would qualify in that, uh, in that realm. There's obviously a lot more to, um, to mention about any of these. I'm very humbled that you stayed on and uh, you participated in all of, um, all of the interactions and in our exercise. Um, thank you so much for all of your responses that you provided here. And Ashok, I'll turn it back to you.